Hi, everybody. I'm Daniel Zeta. This is Matt Otzinger. Unzicker. Unzicker. Yes. What a cool name. So Matt's Unzicker. He is a permaculture, um, a permaculture wannabe shop owner. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I met Except last year in St. Joseph, Missouri. And I am here in South Central Minnesota as a regenerative farmer. So here we are talking about how the heck do we get from the toxic uh, degenerative food system that we now find ourselves in as a society and how do we get to a, a sustainable regenerative food system that works for people and the planet. To like, to get a, a very succinct and understandable presentation of what the problem is exactly like why this is a problem you know because of you know health issues uh eco system issues um fuel you know limitations as far as you know energy costs go or just yeah and then just everything down to maybe just uh dignity of life right so just all those different factors that come into this to kind of lay out what the problem is and then what is it that is going to make or what is it that's actually better you know like what makes the current mode unbearable yeah i i've often been saying that for for a number of years now that it feels like that story of this responsibility of farmers in in America that we are responsible with feeding the rest of the world like it's our moral imperative I feel like that story was pushed onto farmers by people at the top of the industrial food system whether that be like Monsanto or Cargill or any other of the on sellers or or industrial um, producers of food via commodity crops. I feel like they push that story. So in other words, it, it basically helped people create a cognitive dissonance to allow them to continue doing what they're doing, which is a degenerative farming model. Like every year that they are <laughs> decimating entire ecologies, tilling up the soil and, you know, planting a monocrop and then dousing it with chemicals and poisons to get it to grow. Like that, that takes a significant amount of cognitive dissonance to continue doing that because huh. anyone that works with the soil knows that that, that is bad. It's just like, every one of these industrial egg farmers or big egg farmers that I talk to, they all recognize what they're doing is bad for the soil. But they, they always roll out that same old story of, well, we have to feed the world, right? Mm -hmm. So it's like the ends justify the means. And or, and, and maybe it's not even just feeding the world, but it's like feeding it at a price that's approachable for people or it, it matches uh, yeah, like it matches the current mode of life, right? If you didn't do it this way, then McDonald's would have to charge you five dollars for a small fry. That's, right. That's really one of the most uh, like non-talked about things in our culture is that it's not so much about how to feed the world; it's about how to feed the world cheaply enough that we can continue to have the cultural values and economic trajectory that we want. Right. And right now, we've had such heavily subsidized food from from externalizing all the costs onto whether it's the farmers the soil the animals the ecology the economy the local economies small towns everything along the way is externalizing these costs and so mm -hmm. everything is being depleted by this model only to get really really cheap food at the supermarket well we need to start looking at it a little bit more broadly and think well hey if as a culture, America spends less of their take-home pay on food than any other nation on earth, and probably ever in history. Like, I, I believe the last figure I saw was like 12 to 13% of our take-home pay was spent on food. That's Which really, is, really small. 
which you can look at that as an achievement if you want to, right? If that was your goal was to grow right. food as cheaply yeah. as possible and get it in the hands of consumers as cheaply as possible, then we've succeeded. Yep. Right. You know, we've done a yeah. really good job. Congratulations. You guys did it. But if you look, if as you, I'm eating like these little, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. but if you back up and look at it like, okay, so now we're, we're growing this food at an, at an increasingly cheaper rate to get to the consumers cheaper and easier than ever before. But if you look at what we've done as an, as maybe an unexpected consequence is that everybody is getting fatter and fatter and sicker and sicker and, and more and more depressed. And the, pharmaceutical industry's profits are going exponentially higher because we're trying desperately to regain some kind of health from eating all this shit and doing nothing for exercise. And then we, we look to the pharmaceuticals to like make us healthy again. And this is like, you, you just transition to financially, we spend billions and billions of dollars every year as taxpayers in this country subsidizing that industrial commodity crop farming system that is that has all these problems that we just touched on, which makes people sick. And then we spend billions and billions more on insurance to go, that goes to these pharmaceutical companies to try to make us healthier from the food that just made us sick. It's yeah. insane, really. Right, and, but that, I think like that little snippet though embodies why it's so difficult to even begin moving uh, against kind of an already overwhelming uh, flow, right? Because you touched on health, uh, the political economy, the, you know, the logistics of food, transportation, the like business side of things, the accounting, the bookkeeping, the, and then like insurance, and then uh, just, and moral, you know, things. So like, there's just, it, it is so much a part of everything that you can't like necessarily unwound it, unwind it or anything, you know, like it's just, it's such an overwhelming thing. It's, it, I'm, I'm, I wasn't alive in the 1800s, but I would guess that trying to, trying to like unravel a certain thing like how we grow food or even fossil fuels from our from our society is very much similar to trying to unravel or pick out slavery from the 1800s society because it was it was enmeshed and woven in everything and just like today we have a lot of blind spots morally probably where we're like this being one of them you know just we don't mind buying clothes that were made by people in sweatshops we don't mind you know eating food that continues to destroy you know the the planet but because it's really difficult to disentangle one's own morals or ethics from the zeitgeist of their culture around them yep and i feel like that's what we've already done in a lot of ways but i'm sure we have our own blind spots i guarantee it it's just yeah, that so I guess, I have to focus on the food system mm -hmm. and, so and how we can disentangle that. Right. So maybe that's a good, is that, my question then would be, is that a good starting point for the disentangling or kind of the uh, reestablishing an approach to f food and yourself is understanding the moral aspects of it? That's the good thing about this, this complexity of interwoven um, realities that we're talking about is that there's a million points of intervention so it doesn't really matter where you start everybody's yeah. everybody's going to come to this from from a different vantage point like i i know people that have gotten into um, regenerative farming because they had a health scare a lot of them you know got into it because they started looking at their own health because of a of an illness or something maybe an illness yep. in the family so they started looking into where their food comes from Mm -hmm. Some people get into it because they're they're living in the city and they grew up in the suburbs and they they feel empty. They don't know what it is, but they have no sense of purpose and they're depressed. And so they they find regenerative farming because they think, well, this is this could be my sense of purpose. Mm -hmm. um, so like 
and there's a million other ways why or how one would get into creating a different food system or or creating a different reality as far as how food is produced. So I don't I don't know if we have to say one way is the best way to do that. What would be some other starting points then? Like you're basically saying, like these are the different vantage points you can have that allow you to see the current air in the system that we're operating well, in. Let, let's, let's run down a few. So one could look at it um, through the eyes of just pure health to their to their own body or their family's bodies and say, you know, if it is true that I am what I eat, then I need to be putting in quality food into my bodies because otherwise I'm, I'm going to be sick. Um, another one would be ecological health. And so if, if people have some kind of an ecological awareness or ecological um, education where they understand what an ecology is and, and its and its role in nature and it and even like if you're if they're looking at through an anthropo anthropocentric lens how those ecologies are are, are necessary for our own survival mm -hmm. um, they can come in it from that way from an economic standpoint like it, it's not that difficult to drive around any small town um, in America, in the rural areas, and see how how destitute they are. Like they're just ghost towns. All of the main street shops are shut. Um, the only things that are doing a, a bristling business are big dollar generals and WalMarts that are bringing in cheap imported garbage into these rural centers. Mm -hmm. And both, and the only jobs that are available are jobs that are basically like helping to support that toxic industrial food system or service industry. Mm -hmm. There is no meaningful work in rural America anymore. Like hell, even before world war one, almost 50% of Americans lived or worked on farms. And now it's like just over 1% of Americans are involved with the food system. So well, on the growing side of it, right? No. Yeah, on the okay. growing side, on the production side, you're right. Like if you added up all the like the processing jobs and all the on the all the throughput jobs, yeah, it's I'm sure it's more, but it's still still very very small. Right, because this system per prefers people in factories versus farms. That's right. Those were three different types of health: personal, ecological, and economical. So, what would be some other starting points then? Another one would be spirituality. I, I, for one, am not, I wouldn't classify myself as religious, but I would call myself spiritual. And I've just been having this conversation with people on Facebook about how I get, I get a lot of guff from Christians that because they see me as, as worshiping the creation rather than the creator. And they think that that is bad because apparently you're only supposed to worship the creator. But every single person's idea or concept of the creator, if you believe in a creator at all, is different. And every yeah. single religion in, in the history of humans has all had one thing in common. They all believe they're the one true religion, right? Which is ironic. But every single one of them holds a different image of what their creator looks like. I think we could go on and on about points of intervention into recognizing the problems with the industrial food system, but I think all we need to do is, is acknowledge that every single person is going to have a different way or a different reasoning of acknowledging the problem at hand as to how our food is created in this culture. And from that point, then, then we can start looking at like, okay, now that we recognize we have a problem, how do we move forward? Even anyone that would possibly be watching or listening to this is already somehow understanding that there is a problem. What I find interesting is how do we start discussing real world ideas on how to transition our food system from what it is today to what we want it to be? So okay. first we need to be like, okay, we have a problem. Second would be, what do we want a, a food system to look like in the future? Like what is the what is the best possible scenario of a food system that we can even imagine? And then yes. that, that was actually that was a question that was posed by you, and I thought it was really really poignant and really a good question because once you start realize start thinking about what 
would be the perfect, most sustainable food system on the planet, then you got to start thinking, well, how do we get there? What are the stepping stones to get to that future? Yeah. Because it's, it's really important also to remember that the, the situation we're in is unprecedented. No culture or society in the history of Earth itself has ever been in a situation where they had to like, how do I, how, like, how do I intellectualize a different food system from the, the, from the shitty one that we have to a better one? Like, they've never had to do this. Well, I think, you, you don't think people in famine would have had to kind of roll through that? No, because everything that we're talking about isn't a, a, like a, an existential question of how do I get food? It's a question of how do I get food in a better way that's not destroying our land base and our ecology and our economies and our culture. Kind of how we ended up to where we're at because people were like, oh, we don't have enough food or we're like dealing with, you know, we're fighting nature in different ways, right? So we're, we're going to like, rather than trying to grow stuff in a forest, we're going to grow stuff on a flat land, you know? And so our job is to like, terrorist it and you know like all those things are done because people were thinking of something as like this is more ideal to do it this way you're right in the in the past they've always been trying to remove remove things that were out of their control because the things that were out of their control were the things that could possibly create a famine in our minds for for forever we're just like how do we get food easier and remove those unknowns. And, and where we've gotten to is exactly where we've apparently set out to get to. But the thing is, is that there's all these unintended consequences that we had no idea would, would come up. Like every time we introduced another level of control over, the, of, of, over an ecological system, it has roll on unintended consequences. The, the moment that we went off track was the moment we started to to control a very complicated, like such a, such a complicated system, which, which is an ecology. Ecologies are so complicated. And the, the climate system and every, every, like the Gaia, like Gaia, we're trying to control Gaia, which there's like billions of different parameters that are constantly changing. There is no way that we could ever even imagine a way that we could comprehend that enough to control it without unintended consequences. How do we back up to a point in our past far enough back that we're allowing the ecology to work while making or growing food on it? Mm -hmm. And how do we do that in a way that's going to continue mm -hmm. feeding the population that we have? One of the things you were talking about earlier is that there's you know less than, what is it, one or 2% of people are farming our yep. actual food that we consume yep um is there an ideal percentage that that needs to be at or is that something that can uh vary greatly just based on how everything else is set up i mean th this is going to go off on a tangent itself just on the topic of civilization because mm -hmm. i don't i don't know civilization is a very a very recent um, experiment and I would say that it's still going on and I don't think that the, the, the results are in. Basically trying to explain to people that human beings are a story-based species. All of our reality is based on stories that we were told by previous generations and those stories have a lot of power over what we think and how we think today as individuals. And if we recognize that our reality is created by these cultural stories, we can then look at those stories objectively and think, are these stories serving us today? Are they serving the earth today? Are they actually a good thing as they are? And if they aren't, now that we recognize that they weren't given to us by God, they were just passed on by our ancestors, we can then start making choices as to whether or not we want to continue those stories or if we want to supplant them with different stories that actually might work better for us. Mm -hmm. And so it's not to say that civilization is a bad way to organize human beings. It's just more of having more control or sovereignty over our own 
realities. And if we as individuals and as a byproduct, as a collective, recognize, hey, maybe this civilization thing and, and, and having people in cities with, with millions and millions of others isn't such a good thing to do in the long term, maybe we should start thinking about other ways to organize human beings. And personally, I think civilization falls down because by its very definition, civilization is, is organizing and concentrating human beings in a smaller and smaller geographical area to the point that that area no longer has the capacity to meet the fundamental needs of those humans living in it. And so it has to, by definition, be pulling resources from further, further, and further afield to keep that human population alive. And I, I think that as a natural byproduct of that organization, it, is, it, it, it results in disconnection from the natural processes of the earth because the people so, living in that situation are so far removed from everything that keeps them alive that they no longer even understand it. And when we can't care about what we don't know about, and you end up with a whole bunch of really disconnected urbanites that, that mean well, but they have no idea how the natural systems work. With civilization then, is it as much a problem innately or is it as much a, a distribution thing? I think like, it's, there's... It's, a, it is, it's a product of scale. It's a problem of scale. Right, yeah. I think, I think, you know, when there was cities, like there was cities 10,000 years ago, but they weren't, they weren't like 20 million people. Mm -hmm. They were maybe like, 10,000 people, maybe up to 100,000 people, maybe up to half a million. But either way, all those people, I've lived in cities of a half million people, and you can walk outside the city limits and you can see nature with your own eyes. You can see the stars with your own eyes because there wasn't light pollution. Like people in those cities may, be, may have been far more disconnected from the people that were actually still, you know, collecting or growing or raising the food but they, they weren't as disconnected as the people living in the cities today. Like, like everything, gone unchecked, it just goes too far until we get to a point where we're like, hey, this isn't working, and then the pendulum swings. If that's the case, then because it is so connected to the natural system, it, it'll rectify itself eventually, right? It's a problem because every other person that lives amongst the natural world there's a very short um feedback loop if i do this then this happens and it's all within a year maybe a couple years maybe 20 years maybe even five minutes but in the city or in a civilizational level if we keep doing what we're doing it's completely obscene like off off of our view to everybody that's living in that system until everything stops right like if if i slap you like there's an immediate reaction right and then on a grander scale like if i'm slowly over time stealing money or embezzling money from you right like these are all kind of like different violences against other people and so in a sense that's what we're doing by con continuing to be like apathetic and not making a choice we're kind of like causing violence to the next generation. If not the next generation, then the future generations. And it's kind of like a parallel I see as like a violence to someone else, right? Like there's techniques for growing food that you hear about or, you know, different ways of growing food, whether it's, you know, organic or permaculture or regenerative, like there's all these different techniques out there. But then what happens with that? Like there's not like the next three steps that need to happen within this sort of like logistics of if you're comparing it to like an industrial food system where it's like you efficiently obtain the raw material like hyper efficient right as efficient as possible and it's on a huge scale and then it is really efficiently transported to a spot to kind of a, a value added process whether that be the factory or just sticking a sticker on it and getting it in front of the customer like th so those are like the really big important steps that i don't see anything being 
Like there's no terms. There's not a term for something that came from the farm to the customer in a really healthy way or an improved way. Just like you have concepts like organic, you know, now that's a buzzword and some people understand what that means. Although it's been tainted and skewed and, you know, corrupted in a lot of ways. How, how, maybe that's one thing that can start to happen is like, how do you create a term that embodies the concept of something making its way in the process appropriately? I hear what you're saying. I am almost thinking, I want to go a step further and just say, just because the industrial food system does certain things in a certain way, does it really mean that we need to figure out a way to get the more appropriately produced raw ingredients to the consumer in the same way. I'm a firm believer that we have to change our cultural values first. And the only way to do that is to change our individual values. And that has a ripple effect. Culture is a consequence of millions and millions of individual decisions on a Monday day-to-day level. And if, if hypothetically, we could all, as Americans, 330 million of us, change our our cultural values to the point that cheap and convenient is no longer something to be to strive for it's actually something to be ashamed of Mm -hmm. and and we were instead like looking desperately for authenticity and quality and local if those were our cultural values basically the entire system would organically no pun intended recreate itself Mm -hmm. yeah and it might not look anything like this current system that we have. And I guess that is just that that is what makes it so overwhelming is because that might just be part of the um, realization that needs to be made is that you can't so much transition as much as completely rework or uh, revolution. You know. So I, I just feel like incrementalism is dangerous on a lot of levels when you're striving for real change because you're tainting your future vision of what things ought to be with what was and your reality is really being hamstrung by what the reality was and yeah i kind of think that a lot of the problem with our food system is that we do treat the natural world and the products that we grow and that go into these processed foods as a commodity. We don't see them as living beings. We don't see them at, with any reverence or respect. And as a result, they're treated like shit. And as a result, the entire system along its way treats everything like shit, as long as the ends justify the means. Mm-hmm. And I feel like one of the reasons why those labels, organic or you know, whatever label you want to slap on food for the supermarket (laughs) lacks any real power or meaning because the consumers that are looking for those are desperately looking for some kind of authenticity or trust in a system that they don't have any direct connection with where that food is being produced or the people that are producing it. And so they then have to trust a label and it's so easily co-opted or, or bastardized by people with money because it is just this, this really frivolous little link from yeah. the consumer to the producer that can so easily be cut. And I feel like if people actually had their cultural values shifted around where they care deeply about real authenticity, they would, they would find a way to, to shorten that connection point between the producer and consumer, even to the point where a lot of them will blur where the consumer will become the producer. What is it that makes it different between things where like, you know, I, I'm trying to think of examples and I don't know, maybe just interpersonal relationships or even politics where like incremental does work well, right? Or like um, building something, right? Like creating a home, you know, and then you add on to it, you know, like incrementalism works or, or city building, right? Like, for, for systems like that, it, it is a good way to do it, right? And, and what makes a food system so different that it, it really just can't work that way? And maybe, I don't know, maybe, do you think like Bitcoin might be kind of like an analogy as well? Like a whole different monetary system 
Bitcoin, I guess, could be seen as, as in, uh, uh, incrementalism, but it could also be seen as revolutionary. Well, that's why I see it as revolutionary. I see it not working as you can't just kind of incorporate Bitcoin. Bitcoin actually takes over and is the new system. And that's what I kind of wonder if, like, what would be some, are there any other, like, things that come to mind that would be an example that you just couldn't do it incrementally? It was something that had to be done all at once. Our transportation system is probably another one that's, it's difficult to make an inc incremental changes. <laughs> spaghetti patchwork of, of, of infrastructure that's designed only for automobiles. Yes. It's, yeah. it's really difficult to see <laughs> that's going to get people out of their cars. And how much of those things are actually part of the same system being everything's like, connected, right? Are those three things really just part of the same thing that we're talking about? And so maybe we're kind of on this kind of like a uh, moment of turning. Um, in our, in our cultural values, where we're questioning our values. Mm -hmm. I was really excited about the pandemic because I really thought that this is this is finally something that is going to shake us to our core as a culture, and we're going to, as individuals and as a culture, start to really collectively uh, question yeah. why and why we why we've valued what we value because it's yeah. not working for us. It's not right. working for us. Well. Maybe because it came from the system that it's a part of, that you can't have that break because of it. <laughs> Does that make sense? I don't know if I'm articulating what I am picturing in my head, but I'm saying like basically that pandemic is a product of it is the, the current it's mode, right? Don't know about it. And so there's, there's irony in there, but I don't know if there's something yeah, that we need to look. Yeah. Um, I don't know. Like because it's not from outside of it that it doesn't reveal, you know, that kind of thing that you were expecting or hoping for. Yeah. Like it's, it's not, it's not bizarre enough. It's not otherworldly enough. Well, I would honestly argue that it's just not, it's not painful enough. Like I, oh, I know. Not, yeah. I for know, most people probably not. I know for a fact that the, 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 the major like shifts in my paradigms or my realities came from intense physical or emotional pain mm -hmm. that i have gone through and that i've talked to the hundreds of other people that have had the same experience we we as humans generally speaking will continue doing what we're doing until there's significant sufficient feedback that says what we've been doing is not working and then we will change but only then yeah we don't, we don't generally change things that are working for us why would we and so like i just think that this pandemic isn't quite painful enough it's not not to say that it's not painful and it's not to discount the pain that people have felt through but discomfort problems. is different than pain but from but it's not acute enough and it's not widespread enough yeah. for us to really start wholesale questioning how we've been doing things and what we value that's yeah. just theory i don't know yeah, yeah. I could be totally uh, wrong. <laughs> Time will tell. So, yeah. So how do you, like, okay, I want to have more conversations for sure. But I'm wondering, like, what type of format do you give it? Or how, how do you make it a productive use of time? And, and something that actually kind of, like, materializes something, right? Like, personally, I have the donut shop. You have your farm. Like, do we need to like hone in on specific examples of stuff that we're working on or do we need to work on like understanding concepts or like getting that, that kind of like that picture of that ideal? Yeah, I, I think, I think to try to minimize going down rabbit holes and this becoming just a philosophical exercise, we need to, now that we've kind of gotten the groundwork laid out, we can then move forward with more and more and more concrete examples or at least more harnessed thoughts. And yeah, we could certainly use your uh, personal relationship with your business and what you would like to see happen in it um, as an example of a food system because you, you know, you, we're both part of a food system. I'm a producer. You're 
a retailer. You know, you well, you're you're like you're kind of both. You're 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 somebody that assembles ingredients that are that are grown by producers and you sell them. So you're you're a, a large part of the flow on effects of the food system or flow on downstream processing of the food system. Right, yeah, it's just part of that flow. Yeah. But if if everybody in the food system isn't on board with changing it, then it's not going to change. Like if you desperately wanted to change it yourselves as like every everybody in the retail environment was desperately wanting to change it but the producers had no interest, it wouldn't change. And if the whole and if vice versa, if the producers wanted the whole thing to change but you didn't want it to change, it's not going to change. Everybody along the system needs to be on board with it. And that's that whole different system that you're talking about. Like, and so that to me, that's the conundrum because like you're saying this can't be incremental and I'm going like, well then how the fuck do I like change it? If like right now I'm a donut shop using like, you know, non-organic, non-locally produced raw material, you know, it's dried eggs, dried milk. It's, you know, people like you can read our reviews. We really like put our heart and soul into like making good food that people can enjoy. And that's kind of why, like I saw potential with the donut is that it is such a um, like common denominator and it's such a basic luxury that's available to rich and poor. Like it's so, you know, universal in that way. Right. It's a very common it's a denominator. Joy, it's a joy inducing food. Yeah. Yeah. And and so, yeah, and it has so many other elements to it, right? And so, like, how do you take that? Like, if the goal is to, like, be part of a different system that uses, you know, Debbie and, you know, Mark and all the different egg producers, I, I'm going to start using their eggs. And then, you know, like, all the, you know, I think there's, like, one local dairy farm. So, like, you know, how how do you, like, start encouraging people to, like, be – using you know their own local dairies and yeah. and so price go up way more and so now like if I, if i used that system only and used it i just don't know if i would be even sus like sustainable to like exist and then it, like it destroys that avenue right like i've basically like uh, I'm just not even in the game anymore. There's not even a game to be played. And this is where we have to recognize that the economic realities that we live in are due to our cultural realities because let, that's, let's face it, that's all economics is, is a representation of energy. And we put energy into things that we value, right? And so I am okay. still trying to figure that out, but yeah, I, I'm, it, I'm very, I'm very much along the same lines that kind of like a physio, physiocrat kind of, or I forget what they were called, but some of the earlier economists. So I, as a, I, as a producer, regenerative farmer, if I were to do nothing but what I'm doing on the farm, I would eventually go broke and go bankrupt because the people that I require to buy my food to give me profits to continue being here, paying my taxes, paying insurance, and just subsisting, I require those people to care enough to pay a premium to actually keep me on the farm. And there's very few of those people right now. It's growing, albeit, albeit slowly, but I need more people to value how we grow food differently in a more regenerative, sustainable way. And the same yeah. thing would go for you. If you hypothetically started, you know, getting all of your, all of your ingredients, all of like going to a few different local farms and getting pasture raised regenerative eggs and grass fed milk and, and grains that were grown in a regenerative manner in, in a, in a really well thought out, um, um, diversified farm with crop rotations um, and you got all those ingredients there and you had to pay the producers that premium for that food that, that took a lot more energy to produce. Suddenly that donut that now costs like a dollar might cost eight or 10. 
<laughs> it's not that much, but yeah. Well, I'm, I'm just saying hypothetically, because I don't oh, yeah. know, until you actually did it, even just an experiment, and I, I would invite you to do that just as an intellectual exercise to, yeah. find, to make these connections with the, with the producers around you and to make maybe even just like a seasonal donut that you can, you can really uh, market as, hey, come in and get the, the, um, the like spring donut that has all the ingredients that are local within a 10 mile radius of St. Joe, Missouri. And yeah, it's going to be more expensive, but just so people can try it as like a novelty, just to see how it goes over. And, and you can do the numbers pretty easy to figure out, well, what's my cost of production? If my cost of production is only $4, then maybe you could charge five and maybe people would still buy it. But what I'm saying is, is that at certain point, if the price gets to a certain point, maybe your donut shop isn't sustainable if that was your only avenue. And, and then to take a step back a little bit further, maybe donuts, as a food cease to exist unless they're made by your grandma or yourself like they used to be yeah yeah and yeah I, and I, I think that's what happened. so that's what i wonder sometimes is it just inherently like did i not have an, a, a correct way of thinking about it in the sense that you know i saw it as like a connecting point but maybe what it is is just not a feasible sort of transitional point you know or a food item I think if I think if our food system actually did get to the point that we're talking about that we would like to see it where it's actually regenerating the landscape rather than degenerating it or destroying it. I think if that came to be that a lot of the food that we we have known as common foods in our culture would cease to exist. Yeah. Our, our diet would our diet would radically change just the same as it's not that like these like luxury foods and convenience foods didn't exist back in like 1920 rural america or in america in general they existed on some level but they were really really a small part of a person's diet and they were a luxury and they did cost a lot yeah you know yeah I think that's such a bad thing that our entire food reality would change if it was more inti intimately connected with reality of the natural world, and you might just be one of the of the 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 people that would have to just shift into a different mode of being or a different business. Yeah, which is fine. I don't like that's. Yeah, I, I think that's a good thing. Like that would be a, a good thing. That would be considered like a win, right? But like, what would it be? could it transition into something else right like if 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 it's donuts today in order to have that sort of uh hyper local and you know sustainable process what does it need to have a vision towards changing to that is something that services the community better or you know services that sort of transition yeah and that's that's the million dollar question is how do you not put the cart before the horse? It's like the chicken or the egg question, which came first, the, the cultural values or the actual production side of it? And I've been thinking about this for years. I honestly believe that you, we, like, it has to come from the consumers and what they desire. We as producers cannot produce a, a product that they don't want. Even if we think that it's better for them and it's better for the earth, because we will, as an economic consequence, go out of business and go bankrupt. Yeah, yeah. So it has to come from the consumers. So the question is, how do you reach the consumers and inspire them to change their values to the point that it will then change how the producers produce? And this is the most frustrating thing. One of the most frustrating things in my life is that I talk about this ad nauseum with every single person that I can pin down for longer than five minutes, every single one of them will not vehemently that they agree with everything I'm saying. And yet, almost without exception, they go out into the world after getting done with my conversation with them and they'll continue doing exactly what they've been doing. And it drives me bonkers that they yeah. can 
that they can intellectually understand what I'm talking about and agree with it, and yet then go right back to the cognitive dissonance that allows them to shop at Walmart and buy cheap and convenient food and, and milk for $2 a gallon. How does that happen? I, I guess that's telling of how huge uh, of like, I guess a couple of things, how huge food is a part of our lives and how huge the current mode in which we interact with it is. It really must feel and it really does involve uprooting yourself from what you're already so connected to. Like that would be like having some sort of, you know, realization. I, I'm like, I'm remembering a story. I listen, I listen to way too many podcasts that they just so many of them blur together. Right. Or like whatever talks, everything, YouTube videos. And so it's hard, but like there was one that I was listening to and it was about uh, <clears throat> the nuclear fallout in Russia. Uh, I can't remember the name of the village that was nearby, but like those people understood the danger and the like consequences of continuing to live in their home but they were so rooted to that place so a part of that home okay. that wasn't gonna happen like they're not gonna like like so i think to, to me that's kind of a similar situation and like the people that you're speaking with they understand that a nuclear bomb just went off and they know that there's gonna be some fallout but like they're so and myself included, right? Like with different things. I'm already so attached to where I'm at that there's no way in hell that I can uproot myself from that. Even just I, briefly? That, but that's what confuses me. I, I, think that, I think that's why you have to use a cognitive dissidence, right? Like that's why you have to employ that tactic. Otherwise you will make yourself go insane. Yeah. But then how, how do we... How do we circumvent the cognitive dissonance that'll, that allows people to do that? I think we have to like, I, I think that's kind of what we're like, that was, that's kind of the goal of this, right? Is like, we're going to start trying to draw more and more different players into this uh, scenario and start actively materializing these different processes that will allow people an escape from what they know is the fallout. So, so here's, one thing that I feel like has a lot of merit is that I feel like me talking about this and intellectualizing with people isn't doing the job because it is just an intellectual exercise and they feel like they're being preached to and they feel like they're, they should change. What I feel like would help people and has helped people make that shift is when they experience something that is authentic for the first time like a food like let's face it most people have never experienced real ingredients most people have never experienced eating a tomato off the vine or a strawberry right off of the bush like they've never done that and as a result they they just they don't know what they're missing and they like how are they going to care about something they don't know that's the thing we we only care about what we know so i feel like a lot of people that i that i've met from the suburban you know areas the urban centers that have never had these experiences one of the reasons why they are as depressed and as as kind of lost as they are is that they're looking for something that they don't even know what, how to name it. But what they're looking for is, is authenticity as far as I'm concerned, because every, every, like all the marketers recognize this and they try to give this full authenticity and people pay for it. What you're sold. But, but what people really, really want is that authenticity that, that comes from the natural world, but they don't know how to find it. So if, if we, if you were to say make a donut that was from all natural ingredients from the local area, from flour that was, that was harvested just that year and milled literally 30 minutes before the, before the donuts were made. So that flour was not rancid like every other flour that was milled months and months beforehand and sat on a shelf and oxidized. Um, they might have like almost a, a, a spiritual awakening from eating that donut. 
because it like this is the most heavenly thing I've ever put in my mouth because I'm closer to source. I'm closer to the production place of this these things. And by it, by its very essence, I'm closer to the oneness that is, you know, the being, the to God, to whatever, whatever you mm -hmm. want to call it. And maybe then they would be inspired to want more of that. I, yeah, I definitely think that's uh, a large part of it. And then I think there's another side to it where you're going to have people that no matter how authentic of something they experience, they, it, that's not doing it for them. Right. And that's fine. Like we, yeah. there's, we're never like, going to reach no everybody. Like, we're never going to reach everybody, but we need to reach the low hanging fruit. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. The ones that are kind of, yeah, within that niche compatible. Yeah, exactly. And the, and, and as that niche gets bigger and bigger, it's no longer a niche. It's like, it's mainstream. Yep. And then everybody else, because like, let's face it, nothing attracts a crowd like a crowd. The bigger that group gets, the bigger it gets. Yeah. Okay. I still feel a little left hanging as far as like trying to figure out like how do you go on from here and, how do you do it? And, and how do you actually have something materialize like we're saying afterwards right rather than just constantly kind of coming to a philosophical um, understanding of it how do we hone in on specific things and what are those specifics going to be so here's another example of, of more concrete actions I, as a producer, am growing the best quality ingredients that I can possibly grow in a, in a regenerative, ecologically honest manner. And I am trying to further my capacity to help resellers get these ingredients easily, more easily, make it easier for you. So yeah. I've actually, just yesterday, I ordered a secondhand... Um, stone mill a commercial stone mill that was they're made down in north carolina they've been made there for over a hundred years i found one out in seattle that was brand new never used but it's been sitting since 1984 and also that came with it was a, a flour sifter so i can now take the wheat that i grow out in my field i'm looking at it right now it's under the snow but in the spring, when that stuff comes up, I last year I bought a 1952 John Deere pull type model 30 combine and, and rebuilt it. And so I can harvest my own grains. I, I've got a seed cleaner so I can winnow the grains. And then I can put the grain through the flour mill. I can put it through the sifter and I can get it directly to people like you fresh. Okay. Yeah, dude, that would be. That would be really fun just to kind of run through the process. I'll, I'll drive up and I'll pick up a bag and then I'll make donuts out of it. <laughs> but but okay. I think the goal is though is to find somebody like me closer to you. Hopefully. Absolutely, absolutely. I just, I just looked on, uh, I had a, a friend, a family friend and a donut customer. I was talking to him about wanting to uh, understand how to mill my own flour and preferably a stone, which apparently, that's a whole nother conversation. That would be one of the specifics we could go into, right? Like understanding milling flour and stuff. But there's a course here at uh, the university in uh, Manhattan, Kansas, where, you know, like they have a lot of specialists there. And so he gave me information on a course. I won't be going, but they do it every spring and fall. So hopefully one of these days I'll get to go out there. It's, a, it's priced out of my range for now, right now as well. But I really am wanting to go. Uh, explore that kind of side of it and so yeah that is awesome that you have a stone mill you're a badass awesome so what i would invite you to do is as someone who cares about this and wants to change this and also cares about your own health and the authenticity of the food that you consume i would invite you to start you know with my help with other producers help to get the ingredients necessary to start dabbling with this and make recipes of really stellar donuts or yeah. anything else that you want to try and at home for your kids, for your family. And then when you really nail down a recipe that's just 
out of this world, you can unveil it onto the public for your customers, maybe, maybe even like your best customers, like even your top 10 returning customers. Like, hey, Bob, I got this thing you got to try. Yeah. And just, and just see if it spreads because yeah. if there's enough people out there that are willing to do that, mm -hmm. you, and you've got a niche, you've got your market niche. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. So I need to find, I need to find a producer. And down near you, um, grain is going to be easier to find than up here because our climate isn't as conducive to growing wheat or other small grains because we get so much rain. It's hard um, for it not to get um, yeah, moldy or moldy yeah. in the field. Yeah. And so most grain production has gone to further west, like mm -hmm. Kansas, Nebraska, Dakota. yeah. Dakotas. yeah. So I'm sure you could find somebody close to you, like in Kansas, they would, they would have the capacity of growing grains and milling grains that you could strike up some kind of relationship with. Yeah, and I think there's some in Illinois. I've, I've, I've tried to research a little bit, and I see that there's an organic one in Illinois who does it, and then also in Kansas. And then I'm not sure if you're familiar with the Land Institute in Salina, oh, yeah. Kansas, West yep. Jackson. And that would be something that I would like to... Kernza donuts. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. The Kernza wheat. And then, yeah, that's something we, I like to look at with you is the 50-year farm bill. And, and kind of look at that as like, is that a good ideal? You know, does that match kind of what you're seeing? Yeah. It's an ideal. I need so. to read that. Is, is that the Land, Inst Land Institute came out with that? Yeah, I can. Yeah, I'll forward it to you. Yeah, do that. Okay. But yeah, I, I think that's a good start is for us as individuals in the current spot in the food production that we, that we ha inhabit at this moment in time to develop the networking to be able to put it all together ourselves first. And then hopefully it just spreads out. Like even if you had to buy your own small mill and buy the grain and keep it stored and then mill it right before you bake that is something that's totally doable like if they're not that expensive right and that might actually work out better as far as a feasible business model right yeah. you're kind of but creating shipping flour you're shipping grain yeah yeah goals man yeah well i think we should probably then we probably talked enough to think about this more and you can, you can forward me a few things and, and we okay. can, can process what we've talked about. And then maybe okay. another week or two, we can have the next installment. And we can talk more about where do we go? Okay. Yeah. Just like farming. We're just going to be plodding, plodding at this. <laughs> we can do. All right. Awesome. All right, Matt. Well, it's been, it's been real. Hey, I appreciate it, man. Tell Stephanie. Thanks. Will do. All right. See you, Daniel. All right. Bye, Matt.